You saw me from afar And ran to meet me You reached out your arms And I cried out for mercy You took this broken heart And beautifully fixed it You gave me a new start Though I didn't deserve it It's wonderful to be a new member of Transform tonight. I, I think I'm the 123rd member of Transform. <laughs> the only problem is, after li listening to those wonderful testimonies, I'm rather worried that I'm the most boring member of Transform. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so exciting, these fantastic testimonies from uh, Frank and Steve and Mandy and John and Keith and Noel. I just uh, don't know how I'm going to keep compete, despite the fact that. Uh, I give all these talks every year. All I'm going to do tonight is to tell you a story. Um, I've uh, got a bit longer than some of the other storytellers, but it's the same kind of story. And the first point I want to make about the story before I get into the narrative of it is that I am not the hero of the story. I'm just the narrator of the story. The hero of the story, as you'll hear so clearly, is our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. But he takes quite a long time to come into the story. And that's my fault because I kept him out for so long, which is a mistake many of us have made. Um, other thing I'd like to say the story, that um, just to give you a warning about the chronology of it, like most stories, mine, as sort of a beginning, a middle and an end. But I'm going to hop about a bit and I'm going to start at the most dramatic moment of the story, which is the middle, just simply because I know if I begin there, I've got my best chance of holding the attention of a <laughs> discerning audience like you. <laughs> so I'll begin my story um, on Tuesday the 8th of June at 4.35pm, uh, and I was standing in an incredibly uncomfortable place, some of you may know it, the dock of the Old Bailey. And I, a few moments earlier, I'd been ushered into that dock by a very kind court warder who was obviously been racking his brains all afternoon to think of something pleasant to say to me on what was for me a very unpleasant occasion. So he transformed himself into a sort of touchy-feely tourist guide for the occasion. And he said, in a sort of warm uh, kind of tourist guide way, he said, Afternoon mistaken, do you realise you're in court number one? That's the most famous court uh, 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 in Britain. And here is the dock where we had the Cray brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Yorkshire Ripper, Dr. Crippin, and now you. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't in that famous dock for very long because I had already pleaded guilty to charges of perjury. Uh, entirely my own fault, arising out of uh, foolish libel action I brought against the Guardian newspaper. And so all that really had to happen was for the judge to sentence me. And again, you'll know the form. Um, the judge used the kind of language that uh, the judges use on these occasions. He says, the sentence of the court will be, you will serve 18 months imprisonment. Take him down. 
And I just had a chance to blow a kiss to my four teenage children, my then 88-year-old mother sitting a few feet away from me in the well of the court. And then I headed off down, down, down into the subterranean bowels of the old Bailey, um, becoming a convicted criminal. And again, some of you will know the form, you immediately uh, fill in a lot of forms, actually, the first thing you do. But then you get put into a sweat box and driven off, in my case, to Her Majesty's Prison, Belmarsh, in South London. And I hear a murmur from an old Belmarsh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and um, Belmarsh, uh, non-old Belmarshians, uh, know it in prisoner's language as a tough nick. And that's how it felt that afternoon. We came off the, out of the vans, and uh, there were very stern-looking lot of prison officers, some of them with uh, Alsatians on, le on leashes barking at us. And we then got inside, and we were all in a place called The Cage, which is the reception cell of a prison. And I won't forget the scene in that cage uh, as uh, long as I live. Uh, first thing is my social circle expanded beyond the horizon of my imagination in a very few seconds. Uh, and as they arrived in from courts all over London, South East England, um, people who'd been, like me, sentenced and convicted, and a lot of them uh, were in the wildest and angriest possible mood. I wasn't feeling too good myself, but at least I'd thought my sentence was up fair, at least I knew I was going to prison, um, but uh, with the habitual optimists of, uh, optimism of criminals, a lot of these guys thought the jury would believe every word they said, the judge would give them a life sentence, and suddenly they were facing reality, and boy were some of them angry. I remember, um, of course, every imaginable obscenity. Um, I remember one young man being so angry, he charged into the bars of the cage over and over again to his head cut open, blood fall over the place. I remember a gang fighting among themselves, kicking one poor guy in a painful place, shouting, you got the script wrong, you got the script wrong, all your fault. And I remember one young man who tried to escape, which is a pretty counterproductive enterprise if you're starting from an iron-barred enclosure in the heart of Britain's high security prison. Anyway, it was a wild old scene. And just in case you think I'm laying this on a bit thick, I will introduce the one note of humour that took place in uh, my induction, as it's called. And this came when I was taken off to uh, see the prison psychiatrist. Now, you, to get the humour of this moment, you need to remember that um, my sentencing had not gone unnoticed by the great British public, thanks to the great British media, some 500 of whose representatives were by now outside Belmarsh Prison. But somehow that had gone unnoticed by the prison psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame him, he was having a busy day, he wasn't bothering to tune into the media. So reasonably enough, I was just another anonymous prisoner in front of him. So he rattled off an absolutely bog-standard list of questions. Name, uh, date of birth, prison number, next of kin. Does your next of kin know you're in prison? And the question after that was, does anyone other than your next of kin know you're in prison? <laughs> And I thought of those massed ranks of paparazzi, and so I gave the psychiatrist a wry smile, and I said, um, as a matter of fact, I think by now, maybe 15 or 20 million people now I'm in prison. <laughs> the psychiatrist, uh, he, he did not return my wry smile. He said he frowned a bit, and he scribbled rather busily on his pad. <laughs> and then he said, uh, rather sharply, he said, do you mean to tell me you really think that uh, 15 or 20 million people, they were... <laughs> So I, I nodded, uh, and then his tone became gentler and indeed more clinical. Uh, and he, he said to me in a soft, kind voice, May I ask you, have you ever suffered from delusions? <laughs> well, <laughs> my delusions were getting shed that uh, afternoon quite quickly, but eventually I am. Um, I uh, was taken off uh, to a uh, cell by a couple of prison officers, and I think one of them said, sort of, go in there, Aitken, and then the steel door slammed shut, and that's a moment some of you remember when you feel you're well and truly imprisoned. And I sat down on the edge of my bed, and I said to myself, well, it's been a tough day, it's been a long day, probably the worst day of my life, but, you know, they've given me a cell to myself. Um, at least I'll now be able to get my head down and get a good night's sleep. No such luck because the prisoners of Belmarsh, unlike the psychiatrists of Belmarsh, had all been tuning in to the media, and they were very well informed about um, my uh, arrival in the jail. I have the unfortunate distinction of being the uh, only cabinet 
minister in British history ever to be sent to prison. Uh, most people now these days are rather surprised that I'm the only one. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Uh, But that was the way it was at that time. And I think the guys on my left and right who'd heard the uh, officers sort of putting me in the cell, um, just when I was saying to myself, you know, I think I'll, this, at least I'll be able now to get a good night's sleep. Uh, no such luck, because these two guys on my left and right started a sort of chant uh, of questions and answers and people joining in. And then before I knew what this chant had sort of, quizzy chant had spread along the... Uh, Landing and then across the whole wing, and then the whole house block, and then one house block to another. And so I suddenly realized, as I listened to this chant, my blood sort of froze because it was all about me. And as I listened to this chant, uh, I can tell you what it said. As we're in a church, I think I'd better spare you the fruity details of this chant. <laughs> but, but the gist of it was that expletive deleted. Aitken has now arrived and he's in. Uh, He's on the threes and HB3. Tomorrow morning, lads, let's show him. And there then followed a stream of highly anatomical, highly obscene, highly nasty suggestions what the, all those joining in the chant would do to various parts of my anatomy. And I, I, I make light of it now, but I promise you at the time, I was scared, really scared. I mean, I tried to prepare myself for prison, but nothing had really prepared me for that. And I was so scared I then did something rather uncharacteristic. I did, I <clears throat> decided nothing could possibly help me in this uh, dire situation. And so I knelt down on the concrete flagstone floor of that prison cell and said a prayer. I'll come back to that prayer in a moment, but um, perhaps I should go back um, a little further. Because when I was sort of up there in Parliament, in the Cabinet, uh, before that, uh, uh, banker and things like that. Prayer had not been on my agenda. Um, and um, it, so uh, this was an uncharacteristic thing for me to do. Um, but in the months while waiting to go to prison, as you know, one does have to wait quite a long time as the wheels of justice <coughs> grind slowly, um, I think I'd have been pretty insensitive because um, everything was going wrong. Prison wasn't the worst time. I was going through what I sometimes call the processes of defeat, disgrace, divorce, bankruptcy, and jail, which is a pretty good royal flush of crisis by anybody's standards. And I think I'd have been rather insensitive in the middle of all that. I hadn't sort of done a little bit of searching and self-examination. And, um, and I really sort of worked out quite quickly what the problem had been. Um, and this can be a problem at all levels. You don't have to be in the cabinet to be in trouble. The problem, in a word, was pride. Um, C.S. Lewis, in his wonderful book, Mere Christianity, has a chapter which is called um, The Great Sin. And he says it's pride. And he says, first of all, most people who have it don't notice they've got it. Um, and I, some of you may have once or twice heard of a speech I made, I often have to watch it on television, it's called the Sword of Truth speech, and when I watch it I say to myself, gosh, who is that proud and arrogant Burke up there, you know, <laughs> it's me, but, but at the time you know, I didn't notice it really and um, uh, secondly, it's says so C.S. Lewis, it's the complete anti-God state of mind, and the reason it's a complete anti-God state of mind is it sort of puts a roadblock between you and any kind of right relationship with God. If anyone had ever asked me in those days when I was sort of being a successful person, um, are you a Christian? Uh, I'd have said you know, rather nervously, yes, I am. Um, and uh, I actually was sort of a Sunday Christian, a half Christian, which I now know is about as much use as being half pregnant. But at the time, I thought it was <laughs> absolutely fine to uh, just go along to church once every so often and say the right thing things with my lips, but not to do the right thing with my life. Or, and um, secondly, the, the, um, uh, the, the problem with uh, being a half-Christian sort of, is that your relationship with God is all wrong. Uh, again, if I'd been asked, do you have a right relationship with God, I thought, oh, who's this ghastly, cheesy person asking that question? But if I had you know, been honest about it, I think I would have said, oh, yes, but it was the sort of relationship I used to have 
with my bank manager. Uh, in, in the days when there were real people called bank managers and real banks and were not on the end of computers, but in the sort of country town I grew up in and suffered from a good, happy family background, um, the bank manager was an important sort of guy in the small town. And um, there were some things right with my relationship with that bank manager and indeed God. And first of all, I knew he existed. That's a step in the right direction. Uh, secondly, I thought bank manager stroke God uh, was the um, sort of person who ought to be respected a bit. And um, you ought to go and visit him in his premises every so often. So that was sort of a step in the right direction. But the one thing that was absolutely wrong is that I, if I thought of the bank manager or God at all beyond those points, I thought that this was somebody who could be helpful to me, that um, he could um, be useful. He could, um, you know, he was a kindly sort of person. He would um, probably produce an overdraft if I ever spent on the equivalent of the credit card. But I didn't think at all, sort of beyond my own selfish um, uh, instincts and desires, and I didn't think of sort of, you know, keeping to his rules or trying to make him the center of my life, or surrender my will to his, or obey him. So I was a long, long way from any kind of uh, right relationship. People who got me into my, the right relationship <clears throat> um, were probably people like you. Um, and I'm sure there are one or two people here tonight who would have done the kind of things that people did for me at the worst time in my life. <clears throat> they saw me in terrible trouble. And they came alongside me. And I always remember how this started. Uh, one day my doorbell rang and I was very relieved to see it on a sort of video screen that it was not a, a reporter or a cameraman. And I dimly recognized this guy, so I let him in. And uh, would you believe it, he was from a nearby Baptist church. Um, and he uh, said, uh, I know you're in terrible trouble. I keep reading these awful things about you in the newspapers. Can I come in and pray with you? Well, if I belonged to anything at all, I belonged in those days to the church reticent wing of Anglicanism. And we didn't do praying out loud, so I was terribly embarrassed when there was anyone to pray with. And after he finished praying for me, he said, I can see you need regular prayer support. When can I come back? And I promised her, I said, it's so kind of you to come, but please don't come back. And I find all this rather awkward and rather embarrassing. But he was sort of determined, this guy. He had a sort of determination. And he did come back, and he brought uh, another couple of friends with me. And um, they sort of said, well, um, can we pray for you again? And I said, yeah. And at first it was sort of vaguely comforting. And then it started to become a bit more difficult. They asked a few questions. But by far the most difficult thing they ever said was, we've been talking among ourselves, they said, and we think you should do a course. We recommend that you do an alpha course. I said, what's that? And when I had heard it described, and they passed me out of press clippings describing it, I said, I cannot, I said to myself, I cannot tell you how determined I am not to do an alpha course. I mean, happy clappies, twanging electric guitars, <laughs> <laughs> cheesy Christians sitting around in groups, confessing as they are. I'm absolutely not going there. Well, these guys were sort of quietly persistent. And finally, um, I said, well, you keep on saying, you know, you can just go once and even go again. Uh, and so, all right, you know, I'll, I'll go once. And um, I, I went purely out of spiritual politeness, personal politeness. I didn't go, uh, I just really wanted to keep them quiet. And the nice people who I keep on saying. So I went along. And my, I, and I actually just happened, went to the uh, big major church of uh, Alpha, Holy Trinity, Brompton. And I am, um, at the end of the first evening, my fundamental emotion was one of relief. It hadn't been nearly as bad as I thought. I mean, no one had happied or clappied at me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the people hadn't been at all um, uh, cheesy or anything like that. They'd been thoroughly congenial, nice, decent people. But I said to myself, uh, even though it was interesting talk and all that, um, I don't think I'll come back next Thursday if I've got a better invitation. Problem was, there was a time in my life when I wasn't getting any invitations. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I did come back and then came again. The same thing happened, I because I said it's not really for me. But um, uh, you know, I don't think I'll come back. I mean, I did. Anyway, the fourth evening of the course, I think, 
Um, the, the talk was given by somebody rather different. Instead of being a, a vicar or a minister, it was given by a very attractive young woman in a miniskirt. And at that time, I'm sorry to say, I was really much more interested in her miniskirt than I was, <laughs> was in her message. But as I listened to the talk, I realized that she was giving <coughs> a very, very good talk. Um, and the subject of the talk was, how should we pray? And as I listened, and she went through the sort of Bible reasons, the historical reasons, the spiritual reasons, um, I realized I was hearing a really outstanding talk. When she got towards the end of it, she had, she said, now, you know, if you want to um, uh, reconstruct your prayer life, I didn't really have a, a prayer life to, to construct, but um, she said, if you, um, thank you so much, thanks, John. Um, if you uh, want to, that you, there's a little um, thing you should remember, and it's called the ACTS formula, A-C-T-S, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. And I sort of took all this away, and I went home, and I went back to a rather lonely home. My wife had left me by the stage, feeling rather down miserable. I said to myself, well, I did hear an outstandingly good talk that evening, and um, uh, maybe I should try this sort of stuff. I mean, if it's possible that uh, you can open up a line of communication to God by listening to him and praying to him, maybe I should give this stuff a try. What was that she said about acts and adoration and all that, you know, confession? Anyway, I gave it a try, a very sort of inadequate try, and almost immediately my Prayer life, prayer life started to change and then my whole life started to change I haven't got time to tell you all that part of the story but suffice it to say that I became aware that I was travelling on a spiritual journey first of all I did go on doing the Alpha course um, and um, there was a part of it I simply didn't believe in it which was that it was called the Holy Spirit Weekend and we went off to the unpromising surroundings of the Chatsworth Hotel in Worthing where we were told a very dull solicitor was going to call down the Holy Spirit. And I said, no, you know, this is the most improbable thing I've ever heard. Uh, and lo and behold, as some of you know, uh, the Holy Spirit can be called down, uh, and the Holy Spirit can it. And I had an extraordinary spiritual experience, uh, which um, really was a major leap forward on my journey. Unlike many Christian speakers, I can't tell you that there was a moment when I was saved. There wasn't a moment when uh, I was suddenly converted. Um, and I don't think anyone should be worried if they have the same experience as me, because I wasn't getting rid of those roadblocks, those obstacles, quickly. I was uh, still going on making all kinds of mistakes, still self-centered, not God-centered. Uh, falling, sinning, stumbling, backsliding, wondering whether this was, I was just getting over emotional with, and that kind of thing. And yet and yet and yet, despite all those negatives, there was one overriding positive, which I think you'd simply call God's call. Um, there's no Christian saying, if you don't listen to God's whispers, one day you'll have to listen to his shouts. <laughs> and I think in my case, uh, and other proud people's case, you um, you may have to listen not just to his shouts, but to have a divine great kick up the backside to get yeah. you going on the journey. But um, anyway, th that happened, and on my journey, I can't tell you this moment of, of uh, sort of being converted. But, and you don't always rather like going on a train journey across, say, Europe through the night. You don't know when you cross a frontier or a police post, whatever it is. But uh, you do know when you've arrived in the new country of a real and committed faith of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And that happened about six months before I stood in that dock in the Old Bailey, pleaded guilty and went to jail. And that's why, coming back to that uh, prison narrative, that's why that night when the expletive deletives were thundering around, that's why I knelt down and said a prayer. Actually, I exaggerate. I, the right description would be, I tried to say a prayer because um, I was so scared by the expletive deleted chant that I couldn't even get the words of the Lord's Prayer out. I sort of, and I was just about to give up when I felt a little bulge in my prison uniform jacket, sort of top corner, or wherever it was, and um, 
I suddenly remembered what it was because earlier that day in the sort of crowd of uh, on the whole ill wishers um, as I was going to the old Bailey and paparazzi uh, a slightly mad looking guy had sort of thrust a pamphlet into my hand I think he stands outside the old Bailey every day <laughs> doing it. and I, I realised it was some sort of religious tract I don't know what it was but I saw him and anyway I was allowed to keep it uh, when I went through property in the prison and um, and there it was, sitting, and I pulled it out, and I looked at it, and it had um, the title, Praying the Psalms. I'm not sure I knew actually what that meant at that time. But anyway, it, what it was, was a little calendar-type booklet, and it said, Tuesday the 8th of June, um, read Psalm 130, which was then printed uh, on the, uh, in the booklet. And that's a very famous psalm for people in trouble. It begins with the words, Out of the depths of I cry to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. O Lord, uh, be attentive to my cry for mercy. And it goes on with two or three short verses saying things like, Pray, forgive, and you'll be forgiven. Um, be patient. And it ends up, and you will get the Lord's unfailing love and full redemption. And in a way that probably has happened to some of you, but it was the first time I think almost oh, really happened to be a piece of scripture can really sort of zap you yeah. and hit you between you. And I read this. I thought, you know, this psalmist has been here before me. He's been in the depths. We don't quite know what they are, but it's obviously, if you stop and think of them, there are many worse depths than an 18 month prison sentence. Um, there was, um, so, and I sometimes it can't be quite as bad as it sounds. You know, the psalmist got through. He had to go through difficult times, but uh, he ended up with God's unfailing love and full redemption. And I'm sort of heading, you know, on this path of faith, stumbling along it. And uh, maybe this is uh, what I will get to if I trust in the Lord. And I certainly did that night because it had a wonderful effect. It sent me off into a deep sleep for the next seven hours, despite all the expletive deletives being shouted around me. And I slept really like a child for the next uh, seven hours till I was woken up by a cry I got very used to. Uh, unlock everybody out as the officers come down the wing. <coughs> they unlock the door and you had to stand out and have some sort of a roll call. And as I stood on this now my first morning in prison and I was waiting for the roll call in Belmarsh and suddenly... Um, I remembered that the guys on the left and right had been the noisiest vocalists in the chant the night before. And I remembered all those expletive deletives and I suddenly became very, very uncomfortable. Only to find that these guys who apparently had been so hostile the night before were very friendly the morning after. Uh, morning, I said. How are you? Hope you slept well, one of them said. <laughs> and I said, uh, um, uh, one other said, sorry about last night, um, nothing personal, said the other. <laughs> uh, we, we, we were on the tackle, on the drugs, we were just um, letting off steam, you're one of us now, come and have a rosy. Uh, 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 and um, before I knew where I started to get into the um, companionship of my wing. And um, as my eyes grew custom to the landscape of prison, and I was very cautious at first, I started to see one or two things which surprised me, and they won't surprise the ex-offenders, but they will surprise respectable people in this audience. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I assume there are some. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, the, um, uh, the things that surprised me was, first of all, how young everybody was. The average age of a British prisoner is 26, so a uh, big London prison like Belmarsh or Brixton, there are sort of teenagers floating around in the system, 18-year-olds um, and 9-year-olds. And um, then the next thing I was amazed by, the drug culture in our prisons. My first weekend in Belmarsh, I thought I was in some sort of a Moroccan souk rather than English jail, although it was spinning around. <laughs> But the third thing I noticed quite quickly um, was, despite all the bad things people had obviously done, that a lot of the, uh, my fellow inmates were themselves quite vulnerable people, really because they came from the backgrounds you heard in the uh, riveting testimonies. Tonight, no fathers, terrible backgrounds, no chance in life, uh, not an excuse, but tis an explanation. And... Um, but I didn't realize this at first until I stumbled over something which is a fact of life in prison uh, because a young prisoner about my third day he asked me a favor he came up to me and he said look I've got a problem 
I've just had a letter from my brief. Problem is, I can't read it. Could you read it to me? So I read him this letter, which was from his lawyer, uh, telling him the bad news that he and his family were going to be um, uh, evicted from their council flat in Lambeth for non-payment of rent. And, um, and when he heard this, he was absolutely devastated, really angry and really upset. Um, and, but he was lucky in coming to me because I'd had 23 years of experience as a member of parliament doing eviction cases. So I knew exactly how to appeal. I could see a loophole here or there. <laughs> so I said, you have to write to, to the council, you have to write to, back to your lawyer. Um, and, um, and he had a, I suggested maybe get somebody to pay some of these storm rent arrears or find storm, so I, my brother could do that. And, he, and he, I said, well, you better write to them all. And his face fell, and he then said, oh, I, look, I've got another problem. I don't do no reading nor no writing neither. Could you write it for me? Um, I didn't know then, but a third of all prisoners, of course, can't read or write at all in our English prisons, extraordinary science. Uh, so he's not one of a few. Anyway, I wrote these letters for him rather quickly, because I'd done it before, sort of, you know, how to appeal. And, all that. and he watched me in astonishment, tinged, I think, with admiration, because... After I'd finished, with, and he got these three letters which he signed, instead of sort of immediately putting them in the mailbox, which he thought he'd done, or putting them in his pocket, he did something rather extraordinary, which is he behaved like a sort of medieval town crier. He <laughs> held these letters aloft and said, went down the wing shouting over and over again, that MP geezer, he's got fantastic joined up writing. <laughs> Now, uh, this um, uh, tribute to my graphological skills <coughs> fell on the ears of a surprisingly receptive audience because so many people can't read or write. From that moment onwards, there was a queue every single night in my prison cells of people wanting letters uh, read for them and written for them, often on the most intimate subjects imaginable. <laughs> and you get to know your fellow prisoners pretty well if you're uh, doing that. And I was actually very grateful. Uh, first of all, it gave me all kinds of good education, <coughs> things, subjects I didn't know about before. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, secondly, it was extremely interesting. And thirdly, it had some good results. In this sense, I remember an old lad coming up and he said, look, John, he said, do you realise uh, you is having a fantastic impact with all these letters you're writing on the girls of Brixton. He said, <laughs> they can't believe the improvement in the quality of their love letters. <laughs> well, be that as it may, I was making a friend or two, and one of the friends I made uh, was an Irish burglar, uh, unsurprisingly called Paddy. <laughs> and, uh, Paddy was a young man of considerable energy and drive and charm, and he invited me into his cell to have a cup of coffee one evening. And for the first hour or so, because time doesn't matter in a prison, um, he, uh, we talked about the things prisoners usually talked about, um, you know, their regrets, their families, what they're going to do when they come out. 